it's it's a great pleasure to be here uh, again four years later it's my second time in Samos and second time in Greece also just want to make sure this is working <laughs> can anyone hear me without the microphone I guess microphone is good for recording right for your own recording okay so I should I should I, I'll try to keep it as much as possible even though I don't like this microphone that much <laughs> uh, okay uh, so we have about four hours, I think. Uh, I'm going to talk about m uh, memory systems and memory-centric computing systems. And I'll, I'll start with memory importance and trends. Uh, I think we have four hours, but I have, I have material uh, that is much more than four hours, so feel free to ask questions if you want to stop me, uh, if, you want, if you don't want to be hammered that much. <laughs> okay, uh, I, I think Matthias already introduced me. Uh, I'll skip these slides, but I work in computer architecture, computer systems, hardware security, and bioinformatics. Uh, and somehow these batteries are not working very well, so uh, you can probably ask a question right now when I'm <laughs> fetching my other batteries. If I can find them, of course. <laughs> So I have one here, and I have the other one here also. So that's funny. Oh. <laughs> Say it again. Don't touch the cable. The connection seems to be a bit loose, I think. Which, which connection? The cable. Yeah, I, uh, I feel that way also. VGA? It's VGA. Uh, there's no HDMI connection as far as I can see. Is there one? OK. Is there a way to fix it better? Maybe the previous one was better, or I don't know. I'll try to handle it also after I do this. Uh, okay, it's interesting. I think these devices, all of these interfaces we have in these devices are not very good, you know? <laughs> it's a billion dollar business. <laughs> Actually, you're right, I think that's uh, people are making a lot of money out of this dongle business and and we clearly have an energy problem because all these batteries are <laughs> everywhere and we're not doing much about them okay let me see if this works and then I'll handle the I'll try to handle the other problem okay so this one's telling me it has more battery that's good let's see this one no is it a bit better not that much right well, okay, we'll, we'll try to make do. <laughs> okay, uh, sorry about that. <laughs> well, this is really not good though, right? Uh, maybe there's some connection here. Is that better? I think, there. I think we have electrical isolation problems where you were. Is it worse or better? Any? It's the same. It's the same? As long as it doesn't move, it's probably better, but it feels like it's moving a lot. Okay, let me go back and forth. Okay. Okay, anyway. <laughs> if it becomes too bad, please let me know. <laughs> I'll try to handle it, but I don't know how to fix it fully. So th these are the areas that I work on. Computer architecture, hardware, software, co-design, bioinformatics, and security. Uh, and uh, we're going to talk about a bunch of these, actually. Uh, I'm going to touch on a lot of things, especially memory over here, but we're going to talk a lot about uh, heterogeneous and parallel systems, system architecture interaction. And there's a very interesting uh, inter in, uh, interplay between hardware security, energy efficiency, and fault tolerance and fault performance today. As we push the boundaries of scaling, we're actually uh, seeing all of these become problems uh, at the same time. And we, we need to make trade-offs between them. The question is what kind of trade-offs are the best trade-offs uh, among those. Ideally, we would, we would like to get uh, everything at the same time, right? We want hardware security, energy efficiency, fault tolerance, and performance at the same time. But it's not clear if we can achieve all of those at the same time today. And I think going forward, it's going to be very, very interesting. Uh, okay, uh, and I work on genome sequence analysis, algorithms, uh, and architectures, as well as assembly. Uh, I'm going to talk about that also uh, in this a bit. In fact, I'm going to use that as a motivating detour uh, that motivates a lot of the work that I'm going to describe in memory. 
So these are four key directions that we're following in my group. Uh, fundamentally secure, reliable, safe architectures, uh, fundamentally energy efficient architectures, more memory centric architectures, low latency architectures, and architectures for genomics, medicine, and health. And I'm going to touch upon all of these actually in this uh, uh, tutorial. But let's start with the last one actually. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail in the last one. Uh, I shouldn't get too close to this one either. Uh, there are a lot of constraints that I need to deal with. You know, this is like memory design today. You have too many constraints, and as a result, nobody's doing anything uh, to solve the prob real problems. They're, they're just constrained by everything, and they're not moving the needle too much. Okay, so I'm going to start with this one. Uh, I think this is very interesting because uh, this, is, this is an emerging area uh, where we can do a lot as architects as well as algorithm designers. Uh, but we're bottlenecked by one thing, which is really memory, which is really the subject of this tutorial. So I'll start with uh, the dream that we had with one of my collaborators, one of my friends actually. When I started Microsoft Research, uh, uh, I went on a hike with one of my friends who was at the University of Washington at that time uh, in the beautiful Mount Rainier. And he was working on genome analysis, essentially genome sciences department at UW. Uh, and I was at Microsoft Research. And we, wanted to, we were brainstorming and we wanted to essentially design a device that can analyze someone's or any genome uh, within real time. We were dreaming about this, of course, because uh, we wanted an embedded device to be able to do that, and we wanted to give this to the doctors or whoever wants to sequence a genome so that they can make a decision based on that genome, right? Decision could be figuring out what segments these, this particular DNA segments matches with, what is the likely genetic disposition of this particular patient uh, to this particular drug, uh, and the patient may be under uh, uh, a very serious threat at that point in time, uh, so you need to make a very quick decision. You cannot wait for two weeks to actually get the results of genome sequence analysis out, uh, and many other potential questions. So if you actually had this embedded device uh, that could give you these results very quickly, it could hopefully enable many, many things and discover, uh, discoveries in science and maybe uh, medicine as well. But of course, uh, at that time, we didn't even have the device that could sequence the genome in an embedded manner. Today, actually, we are very lucky because we have these devices that are really small. And I'm going to give you examples from yesterday. Actually, we still have those other devices that are huge. Uh, but we believed in the technology, and we believed that there would be these devices, and the, the bottleneck would be computational. Okay, so I'm not going to go into detail. This is actually the subject of a really other, another talk uh, that I give on bioinformatics. But everybody knows about some basic biology. Our genomes consist of these base pairs, ACTGs, and these are real. Uh, this is actually a really interesting one because uh, this is uh, a real uh, genome that led to a lot of discoveries uh, in, in genetics. Uh, it's Henrietta Lacks' genome, and uh, it was taken from her without her consent. So there are a lot of privacy-related issues in genomics as well, which we're not going to touch into clearly uh, today. I'm going to mainly use this as a motivator. So what's the, uh, what's the goal in DNA sequencing? You start with uh, a DNA, you get the DNA, and you want to find the complete sequence of ACTGs in this particular DNA so that you can ask questions to it, basically. Do I have a gene that's actually not good for whatever uh, uh, disease, for example? The challenge is, uh, there is no machine that exists today uh, that takes this long DNA as input. Long DNA is 3.2 billion base pairs around that and gives the complete sequence to you as output. Basically, you don't have a machine that gives you the complete sequence. All machines are actually choppers. They chop DNA into pieces and they give you these relatively small pieces with some error. They're not perfect in the identification of those small pieces, but they do not tell you how do these pieces fit together. So essentially, you have a computational puzzle. You get these small pieces. Some machines actually give you pieces that are 150 to 300 base pairs long. These are actually high throughput sequencing machines that people have developed that has caused a revolution in genomics. And the puzzle is figuring out how these 150, 300 base pair pieces, many of them, fit together in a 3.2 billion base pair genome, which is not an easy task. I, I, I liken this task uh, to, to these untangling yarn balls. If you have a cat that plays with yarn balls, essentially uh, you have choppers, you chop, uh, you, you cut uh, these yarn balls into pieces and you don't know how, the, uh, how to reconstruct the yarn ball. You need to develop computational methods to reconstruct the yarn ball. This is actually very similar to how DNAs are sequenced because if you actually get some DNA, you may actually have many other DNAs 
of bacteria, for example, uh, that, that, are, that is interfering with the thing that you're sequencing. So there are a lot of really interesting computational issues over here, algorithmic issues as well as systems issues. And these are the choppers that we have today. This is a bit old, of course, uh, but uh, for example, when we were dreaming, uh, we didn't have this embedded device. Today, uh, this was actually introduced in 2014. You can see that it fits in someone's palm. Uh, and people are using this to sequence viruses in Africa, for example, at very, very low cost. You can buy this device for about a thousand bucks or two thousand bucks, and you can do the sequencing yourself. Of course, the problem is you need to somehow process the data uh, to understand what you've sequenced, and people who are doing this research in Africa right now are sending the data that they gather with these devices to data centers in the US or Europe, so they're causing a lot of data movement across the world to be able to understand what's going on in a genome. I, I find this really unacceptable uh, at some very basic level because you're really causing all this energy inefficiency to get some work done where if you, if you were building these devices right, you could actually do this inside the device. Okay, so that's a chopper, for example. This is another chopper. This chopper is about $3 million. Uh, uh, it's much more expensive. Uh, and this chopper actually chops uh, the DNA into small pieces, about 150, 300 base pairs. Uh, and uh, its accuracy is very high, it's about 99%. This chopper chops the DNA into long pieces, about 1 million base pairs long, still much shorter than 3.2 billion base pairs, but its accuracy is not very high, its uh, error rate is about 10 to 15% still. So people are interested in finding the best chopper, uh, developing the technology, and, but it's, it turns out it's not very easy to develop a technology that gives you very long reads at very low error rates. So essentially, we will have this computational puzzle for a long time until someone develops a machine that's essentially giving you the entire DNA or most of the DNA with very little error rates. So clearly, these machines have enabled a lot of things. Uh, the Human Genome Project was the first one. The, the entire human genome is, is still not entirely verified today, but it has enabled a lot of things. And this is a, uh, this, uh, this is a picture that a lot of people show when they sh talk about this genomic revolution. Uh, you, uh, you, we are looking at the cost of uh, sequencing a, ge a genome here, essentially tracks Moore's law until the development of high throughput sequencing technologies, which reduced the cost significantly, as you can see over here. And this is, uh, in 2014, the development of these embedded devices actually reduced the cost even more. So you can see that uh, the cost of uh, sequencing a genome has been reducing much more, much faster, at a, at a rate that's much faster than Moore's law provides us cheaper transistors. As a result, you see that people are actually sequencing genomes. Many big countries have huge projects that actually uh, analyze genomes. And this is going to be a huge data deluge going forward. Basically, we can produce genomic data today much more, much faster than we can analyze it. Okay, so uh, why? Essentially, we've, uh, this technology is very good. We can, uh, we can sequence uh, genomes at a very high throughput, but we're bottlenecked in the read mapping part, basically understanding what those, uh, how those uh, fragments fit together. And then read mapping, basically every genomic analysis starts with this read mapping, understanding how those pieces fit together. Then you can call variants. Variant calling basically says, okay, how different is this particular uh, piece that I'm looking at is from, is from some reference piece. And then you can enable scientific discovery or some medical uh, benefits. So these are some example questions, of course, right? If I give you a bunch of sequences, you can tell me where they're similar, where they're different. These, this multiple sequence alignment. This is an, another example that you can see. Of course, this, can, this multiplies with the number of genomes that you have, and number of species that you have, and number of samples that you have. So it's actually a lot of data. And uh, clearly, you can do studies like this. Uh, surprisingly, we're very similar as humans to each other compared to bananas, but sometimes that doesn't seem to be, <laughs> uh, seem to make sense, right? <laughs> anyway. Uh, so there are many studies we can enable, given a bunch of short sequences, can you identify the approximate species cluster? Uh, this is actually very interesting. You can find uh, where genomically unknown or organisms fit in, in the tree. Uh, and essentially, to be able to do that, uh, we need to understand uh, what this machine is giving us. But we're really bottlenecked in the mapping process over here. I'm going to define the mapping in a little bit more detail later. But take these numbers with a grain of salt. Of course, this depends on uh, what kind of analysis that you're doing and what kind of machine you're using. But uh, with a single laptop, for example, uh, our goal was actually build an embedded device, but with a laptop even, uh, analyzing human genome takes about two, uh, a week or two weeks, depending on 
what analysis you want to do because analysis is not exact also because uh, whenever you're trying to map uh, the, the, the fragments that you get from a, a sequence genome to a reference genome you don't want to get an exact match because there is no exact match because uh, if I'm comparing my genome to Luigi's genome, for example, it won't match exactly. There will be differences. <laughs> Maybe it will. I don't know. <laughs> but I, I, I can guarantee you that it won't. <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, so you really want to uh, look at how different they are. And to be able to look at how different they are, you really want to uh, uh, look at a, me a metric called edit distance. And you want to increase the edit distance that you want to look at between these uh, different fragments. And as you increase the edit distance, this process becomes even slower, actually. OK, essentially, the problem we have at hand is we can sequence genomes really fast, chop them into pieces, but we need to reconstruct the entire genome from these many reads. These pieces are, co are called reads. And the uh, problem we have is called read mapping. So we have many short DNA fragments, reads, and we want to map them to a non-reference genome with some differences allowed. And those differences are what I just mentioned, actually. Uh, there's the other problem, which is the genome assembly problem. You don't even have a reference genome. Uh, then there are different algorithms to it. That's an even harder problem. Sometimes you use some reference to actually assemble the genome. Sometimes you don't use a reference. Uh, when do you don't use a reference, it's called a de, de novo assembly. It's even harder. I'm not going to even talk about that. There's a lot, there are a lot of graph, graph algorithms that are uh, associated with it. So essentially, we have DNA that lo logically looks like this. Physically, it looks like this. We chop this into pieces. We get these reads that are small. And then we have a reference genome that we've constructed in the past. And we want to map, figure out where these reads map to in the reference genome approximately, not perfectly. Okay, And it's challenging because we have billions of small reads uh, mapping to uh, a lot of locations in the genome. So, uh, how, how, do, how did existing mappers uh, do this uh, in the past? Essentially, uh, whenever you want to compare a small piece uh, that you've sequenced to a small piece in the reference genome, you, you want to figure out the edit distance. And edit distance is the uh, minimum number of edits, insertions, deletions, and substitutions, which all have different meanings, biologically actually, uh, that are needed to make the read exactly match the reference segment. And you want to be able to find these uh, well. So I give an example over here between uh, Netherlands and Switzerland. These are two fragments, essentially. And if you want to compute the edit distance, there are multiple ways of computing it. And there are many algorithms that people have developed. But basically, uh, here you see that uh, there are two mismatches initially. There is one deletion in Netherlands. Uh, this I is deleted. And this T is a match. There is another mismatch. And there, is, there are a bunch of matches over here. And you can see that there is an insertion in Netherlands compared to the reference Switzerland in this case. So how do you do this? Basically, people use dynamic programming algorithms uh, to be able to do this. And it's actually very expensive. If you think of Hamming distance, Hamming distance is easy because you just compare everything. Here, you really want to find the insertions, deletions, and mismatches. OK, I'm not going to go into the algorithms in detail over here. If this was a, a different talk, as I mentioned, I'd be happy to go into the detail. But I'd be happy to talk separately. So what are the challenges in read mapping? Basically, we want to find many mappings of each read. How can we find all mappings efficiently? Uh, we want to tolerate small variances and errors in each read, as I mentioned earlier. Each individual is different. Subject's DNA may slightly differ. And you actually would like to figure out those differences because people have shown that those differences are the ones that can actually lead to uh, insights into the differences between the species and also insights into uh, f uh, some of the genetic problems or mutations that you may have. Then the key question is how can we efficiently map each read with up to E errors present? Uh, in Netherlands versus Switzerland, for example, we had here one, two, uh, well, one, two, three, four, five errors present. If our sensitivity was less than five, we wouldn't be able to get a match over here. But if our sensitivity is greater than or equal to five, then, we, then our algorithm should be able to say, okay, Netherlands and Switzerland are similar to each other because our sensitivity is five or more, right? If you set your sensitivity to one, for example, maybe your algorithm is simpler, but you may be not be able to see this approximate match between Netherlands and Switzerland. Okay, uh, and also on top of this, you want to do this very fast because performance is important. This may be a life critical decision. And human DNA is huge. Uh, these small fragments are very short. So as a result, you have many of these. And usually, actually, uh, you, don't do, you don't sequence a, a genome only once. You do it many, many times. And you want to actually uh, do this read mapping many, many times so that you can build a confidence level in what you're getting because there are errors present in the machine as well. 
So how can we design a much higher performance read mapper? Clearly, I'm not going to answer all of these questions. When we first started, we actually wanted to design a mapper that's high performance, uh, that's efficient, and that can actually uh, give you a very nice sensitivity. Where, where E errors, where e, e could be very large. And essentially we did that uh, with my friend that I mentioned. This is our first paper in the area in Nature Genetics 2009. Uh, the mapper is out there, people are using it, it's called the Mr. Fat Mapper. And it's the first mapper that we know of that's guaranteed to find all mappings uh, as you increase E. So it can tolerate up to E errors in this case. So it's very sensitive, but it's very slow, like other mappers. Actually, other mappers are not uh, very sensitive. Uh, some of the other mappers were not very sensitive, so they were faster. But this actually makes it slow because it's very sensitive. Uh, and I believe it's going go in, in the future we want more sensitivity because uh, I believe the discoveries actually lie in this sensitivity. And people have shown that in, uh, in, in biology. So if you look at the execution time breakdown of this mapper, most of the time is spent on this approximate string matching that I showed you, the edit distance computation using dynamic programming. And it's called read alignment also. Uh, so our idea was to try to get rid of it. Essentially, we have this read mapping bottleneck uh, because we're, we're doing dynamic programming. I'm going to give you the key idea that has occupied us for the next, let's say, eight years or so, and it's still occupying us, although we're developing very different algorithms right now. And the key idea is very simple, actually. You build a hierarchical mapper. Instead of building a single level mapper that where you get a fragment and you want to you actually search all of the possible locations where you could have a potential match and then do edit distance computations in all of those locations, you build a filter that's really fast that quickly tells you whether this fragment is going to match a particular location in the reference genome. And that filter can be built really fast because it doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't need to find all of the errors. Uh, it, can, it just needs to tell you whether you should actually do the more heavyweight computation in this particular location. And that's the idea. Again, you don't need to know like, exactly how this is done. I'm going to give you references. But if you have this hierarchical mapper, you improve performance significantly because you're minimizing these costly edit distance computations uh, that are based on dynamic programming. And that's essentially what we did in this particular work. It's called FastTash. It exploits the structure of the genome uh, that you're uh, mapping to, uh, to minimize these computations uh, by building a very fast filter. And then later we actually accelerate this filter through hardware software co-design. Essentially we introduce a metric called shifted Hamming distance. If you have a filter that can be approximate, you can actually, you don't need to compute the edit distance, so you can actually compute something that is a, a, an approximate version of the edit distance so that the filter can be very quick and can actually quickly reject or accept uh, 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 the, the, the fragment, uh, the particular location that you're comparing to. Again, I'm going through this really fast, but my purpose is something else, not, not to really tell you exactly how these work. But I think I find these fascinating also if you're interested. This is a very rich area to develop both algorithms and architectures. And then we actually uh, put this on an FPGA, and of course FPGA has its own uh, benefits and downsides and we found that uh, oh by the way this this particular uh, optimization that we did purely software it, it it improved the performance of the mapper by about 20x this particular optimization we did it, it improved the performance of the mapper by about 3x it was faster than the fastest algorithm uh, that was published uh, in the area and then putting uh, the mapper on an FPGA with adjustments of course improved the performance of the mapper by another 10x so you get actually significant improvements as you keep doing this, as you go more and more into hardware. And this is one of our latest filters, it's on an FPGA. Our goal in this case was to improve accuracy, not performance. So this is actually a lot of tricks that improve the accuracy. And this is the, actually the latest work uh, that I'm not going to talk about. It improves both accuracy and performance. This gives you another 10x uh, in terms of, uh, by, by changing the algorithm significantly. Okay, so why am I telling you all this? Basically, this is, I think, an important problem. The data is uh, growing, and this is a particular application where uh, we are heavily bottlenecked by data movement. The FPJ performance uh, of the gatekeeper uh, algorithm that we developed is limited by DRAM bandwidth. We, we have enough uh, computation capability, but we're actually limited by DRAM bandwidth. And that's true for uh, the shifted Hamming distance, the, pure, uh, the software hardware co-design version and SIMD uh, uh, instructions uh, as well. So if you actually design your software and hardware well, you're bottlenecked by the DRAM bandwidth in the end, because you need to bring in these, uh, this data. So right now we're actually uh, looking at solutions like processing in memory that can alleviate this bottleneck. We're going to talk about that in the next few hours uh, later on. However, again, with processing in memory, we need to design mapping and filtering algorithms to fit processing in memory. 
Again, I'm not going to talk about that, but this is one of our works on processing in memory. This is how to actually map the filter on processing in memory uh, with a 3D stacked architecture, and this improves performance by about 4x or so. But I don't believe we really optimize the algorithm. I think there's a lot more potential over here. Okay, so let me quickly recap. Basically, what we've done is we've exploited the structure of the genome to minimize get rid of computation as much as possible. And getting rid of computation actually gets rid of a lot of data transfer as well. And we actually morphed and exploited the structure of the underlying hardware to maximize performance and efficiency. And as a result, we get significant performance improvements if you put all of those on top of each other. And we actually improved the accuracy also, but I'm not, I haven't told you exactly how we did it. And I think uh, the future is actually very uh, exciting because now we have these devices that we dreamt of in 2007. These didn't exist. In 2014, we had these. This is called nanopore sequencing. And these devices actually uh, uh, sequence the DNA through a nanoscale hole. As, the, uh, as, as, as current passes, uh, as, uh, as DNA molecules pass through this nanoscale hole, they actually uh, cause different current. And you can sense this current to figure out whether you're passing an AC, T, or G. Of course, there's a, there's a lot of error in these devices, but it turns out you could do this process uh, across very large fragment, fragments of DNA, like one million base pairs. So I think this is very promising because it, it's increasing the read length, which is good, but it's also increasing the error rate, which is bad, because now you need to do a lot more analyses to overcome the error rate. But this is an, a device that's bottlenecked by data movement also. And we recently written a paper that talks about the challenges that you have in a genome assembly using such devices. Basically, the first uh, challenge is actually base calling. Base calling means that whenever you get this current reading, uh, do you call an A, C, T, G based on that current reading? And how do you actually make it correct? Because there are correlations in the errors that you have in this device also. So people use a lot of tools to actually call these bases correctly to begin with. And it turns out this is one of the big bottlenecks. And we've been focusing on the read mapping bottleneck over here. Uh, for other devices where this is a big bottleneck. So it's actually a very long pipeline that I didn't talk about. And this pipeline is very interesting to examine, very rich to examine. There are a lot of very interesting algorithms that are employed. There's a lot of machine learning over here, for example. As you can see, there are deep neural networks employed in some of them. Uh, there are a lot of graph processing algorithms over here. There are a bunch of different types of algorithms, combinations over here. A lot of approximate string matching employed here. Uh, and a lot of other things, which I'm not going to go through. If you're interested, uh, this paper is out there. Okay, let's, uh, uh, let's circle back, basically. This was our dream uh, a bunch of years ago, I think 12 years now. Basically, we want an embedded device that can perform this comprehensive genome analysis within a minute, let's say, real time. Uh, where are we now? Well, there, we still have a long ways to go. We didn't solve the problem. We're not even close, I think, because we have a huge energy efficiency problem. We have a huge performance latency problem, even though we improved performance 300x, in better cases, maybe 1,000 or 2,000x, it's not enough. We really need 10,000, 20,000, 50,000, 100,000x uh, performance improvements. I, I don't think 100,000 is enough also uh, to get this to within a minute. And also there are security challenges, privacy challenges that I'm, I have not even talked about, which is really not the subject of what I'm going to describe. But essentially we're bottlenecked by uh, memory in energy and performance at least, and I also believe security too. but. Uh, we can uh, philosophize about that later on. So that's the reason I actually uh, talked about this. This is actually part of a much longer talk uh, that I give at different places. I'd be happy to talk about that uh, later on. So I, I think future applications like this, uh, these are applications that are not there, in my opinion, yet. Future applications are this, or are already bottlenecked by memory, because we have a huge data deluge uh, that's going on. Now let's focus on memory as a result. Any questions, by the way? OK. So I'll keep going. Feel free to interrupt me with questions. Otherwise, I can, I can talk a lot. My slides per bandwidth can be very high. And actually, I think the best way of taking advantage of this is perhaps not trying to read everything on the slides, but trying to listen and uh, maybe uh, read some of them. But if you try to read everything on the slides, it's not going to work. <laughs> the slides, you can, you, can, you, can tr you can try to actually look at them later on, perhaps. Or if you really want to read something, you have to ask a question to stop me. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to talk about why is memory so important, especially today, and then we're going to focus on some really interesting issues, in my perspective at least. So I'm going to motivate the importance of memory from multiple perspectives. I think I've already given you the application level perspective, which is related to performance and energy. But I'm going to talk about this a little bit more, performance, energy, scaling, reliability, and security perspective, and then uh, talk briefly about trends, challenges, and opportunities, and then we're going to delve into a little bit more detail. 
Essentially, we're going to focus a lot on uh, the main memory system. There are a lot of issues in other parts of memory. Clearly, caches, interconnects over here, they're important. There are many interconnects over here, and the storage, that's also important. But main memory is very unique, I think, because it's, it's fast access memory, and it has a lot of data that can store right now, and we have kind of ignored it a lot. I think caches, we have not ignored that much. So International Symposium on Cache Architecture has been around for a long time. It's ISCA's nickname, right? It's, it's actually computer, computer architecture, but people used to call it cache architectures because of the number of cache papers that are published every year uh, over there. But it's, not, it's clearly not co uh, called International Symposium on Memory Architecture. Uh, but main memory is a critical component of all computing systems. Whatever you're designing, you need to have some working storage, and usually that working storage is based on DRAM today. And this system must scale in many, many dimensions in terms of its size, in terms of technology, efficiency, algorithm we use to manage it, and cost to maintain the performance growth and the technology scaling benefits that we've been used to for a long time. Now, you may attach processors to it, you may attach FPGAs to it, you may attach GPUs to it, you may attach a heterogeneous combination of these devices to it, which is really the case in today's SOCs. You're basically bottlenecked by main memory. This is my cartoonish picture of the main memory system. If you look at a node that we designed today, uh, computation is not a problem. Essentially, we have cores or accelerators all over the place, but they're a small part of the real estate. Everything else is dedicated to caches, interconnect, other caches, other interconnect, memory controllers, other interconnect, main memory, other interconnect, storage. Essentially, most of the system is really dedicated to storing and moving data. We're calling these devices computing devices, computers. But most of the real estate is not really computing. It's really storing and moving data. And we're going to get back to this. Uh, and if you, even if you look at the cores inside, most of the core is really interconnect and uh, uh, data storage units, like register files, L1 caches, uh, other buffers. OK, so I think computing is not a... Um, not a hard problem today, at least. Of course, we should invest in it still, but we should not ignore the, uh, the, the, the part that we're dedicating most of our resources to. OK, let me tell you in one slide the state of the main memory system that, as we have it today. Uh, we have re some recent technology architecture and application trends that lead to some new requirements from the system and that exacerbate some old requirements. And we've always demanded a lot from the system. We're going to demand a lot more going into the future, as I mentioned with the application that I described. I will show you hopefully that DRAM, the technology we use and we've been using uh, to build main memory with for more than 50 years now, uh, and the memory controllers, as we know them, as we design them today, are already failing us. They're not satisfying all the requirements, as we will see from evidence in the field. And there's also some emerging memory technologies that happen to be non-volatile that enable new opportunities, like merging of memory and storage. I'm not going to talk as much about emerging memory technologies because we don't have enough time, I think, in this uh, four-hour tutorial. But I think a lot of the ideas that we're going to describe are going to be also applicable to emerging memory technologies. And I think sometimes even better applicable to emerging memory technologies than DRAM, where I will give examples from. So it's good to keep in mind that emerging memory technologies can actually disrupt uh, maybe some of the stagnance that we see in, uh, in, in the DRAM space. Because if someone comes up with a very good technology and it dislocates uh, DRAM in the field, DRAM manufacturers may need to do something very different also. Okay, so I believe given these trends, we need to rethink the main memory system and the systems we're designing around it uh, to fix the issues we're having with DRAM and to enable uh, some, at least one of these emerging memory technologies while of course satisfying all the requirements. So now let's take a look at these trends that are affecting main memory. I believe there are three major trends. Uh, one is we need more memory capacity, more bandwidth, more quality of service, more, and lower latency. Uh, essentially, this is about performance over here, broadly. Uh, energy and power is a key system design concern, and uh, DRAM technology scaling is ending on top of that. So uh, let's take a look at the first one. Why do we need more capacity, more bandwidth, more quality of service, uh, more predictability from the memory system? Essentially, there are three major trends that lead to, do the, lead to this. Esse we can put more cores, more agents, more units, more computing units attached to main memory. They demand more. Uh, applications are becoming increasingly data intensive. And uh, we, we want to consolidate more and more in all of the devices that we have. As we consolidate more and more, we get a lot of area efficiency and resource efficiency benefits. But this increases the capacity, bandwidth, and quality of service requirements up and up. Okay, this is one example. Uh, this is an old paper right now from 2009, ISCA, HP Labs, and University of Michigan. They basically showed that DRAM capacity is not increasing as fast as core count. And 
you may argue uh, it's, it's good to uh, take a critical look at all of these graphs that I'm going to present. You may argue that this may not be the case today. It may or may not be. I think in GPUs it's definitely the case. GPUs are still growing in core count much faster than memory capacity and their memory capacity bottleneck very heavily. In CPUs it may, uh, the, the number of cores, uh, the core count, uh, the increase in the number of cores may have slowed down a little bit. But it's always good to ask the question, why has it slowed down a little bit? It's not because, of, because we cannot put more cores because there, is a lot, there are a lot of transistors. We can put a lot of cores, but we're not putting more cores perhaps because they're bottlenecked by memory. We cannot supply data to them. As a result, we're putting more caches, right? bigger caches. Okay, so it's, I think this is very telling. It's good to also think about why the trend may be changing or may not be changing. So uh, they, they've shown that memory capacity per core is expected to drop by 30% every two years. And this is not good, of course, because people rely on having more memory capacity per thread so that they can get better features in their software. And actually, transform memory bandwidth is much worse if you plot them. Uh, memory bandwidth uh, is increasing by about 10% every year, which is not good. With 3D stack technologies, it actually increases. It has, incre it has a step function also, so it increases much more than 10%. But uh, after that, it's not increasing as much also. So essentially, we are able to design many cores and put many cores on a chip, but we're starving them in terms of bandwidth and capacity. Okay, let's take a look at the DRAM chip trends from a chip perspective. This is uh, trends over the last 18 years until 2017. And we're going to look at memory improvement in capacity of a DRAM chip, bandwidth of a DRAM chip, and latency of a DRAM chip. And this is the most common DRAM chip of the day. Think of DDR. Don't think of any uh, fancy technology. Does anybody know how much capacity has improved over the last 18 years in this time span? Any guesses? 10x. 10x. 100, I heard, I think. I think it's closer to 100, actually. It's 128x. So we've been doing well in capacity, except in the recent times. As you can see, capacity is increasing exponentially over here, because this is, as you can see, logarithmic. Uh, but recently, it slowed down. And this is because of the scaling problems that we're having with DRAM. And we're going to talk about that. And DRAM chips are actually designed for capacity. DRAM manufacturers, that's the highest goal that ha they have in mind. Of course, they want to have high bandwidth. They don't care about latency usually. They want to keep the latency, which is unfortunate. But we're going to talk about that also. But if they're really designed for capacity. And even with capacity, we're having problems recently. What about bandwidth? Again, this is not 3D stack, GDDR. This is really DDR, vanilla DDR. How much has bandwidth improved? 10. OK, that's, this is closer to 10 now. It's about 20x, actually. So bandwidth, of course, bandwidth is a function of power, pins, uh, uh, and the money that you want to pay for all of that. Uh, and that has been increasing. And in some specialized chips, it's been increasing a lot more, GDDR, for example. Uh, and we have a paper, paper, actually, that's recently published at Sigmetrics that analyzes which workloads benefit from which types of memory. Uh, I'd be happy to talk about that later on if we have time. Uh, and bandwidth is important for some workloads, clearly. And it's been improving not too shabbily, actually. And with 3D stacking, this doesn't include the 3D stack memories. It's going to improve even more. What about latency? Less than 5. Less than 5. 5x, you mean. Yeah, so flat. flat. It's mostly flat, actually. Five is, yeah. uh, this is DDR again. Uh, it's about 30%, which is essentially flat in the last 18 uh, years. And of course, uh, there are reasons for it, right? Latency and capacity are at odds with each other, usually. We will talk about that if we get to it. Uh, but also, there is a design mindset and also a business mindset that says we should improve capacity uh, that, uh, that sells the DRAM chips. I believe latency is going to be even more important. And the, the paper that I mentioned, actually, the Sigmetrics paper that was published this year, it's called Demystifying Workload DRAM Interactions, shows that DRAM latency is very important for many workloads that we've examined, especially if you cannot hide the, par hide the latency in some way with parallelism. Okay, so DRAM is crit clearly critical for performance. There are many applications that are bottlenecked by many of these, actually, capacity, bandwidth, and latency at the same time. Uh, different parts of the application are bottlenecked by different things. I guess this is moving again. Okay, I'm not going to touch it. Memory is a performance bottleneck. And actually on the, I don't want to call this the lower end, but maybe the small scale end, which is really not the lower end. Actually, these are some of the highest performance devices that we have today, I think. Uh, the, the mobile phones, in terms of the energy constraints uh, they have. Uh, actually, I, I believe some of the processors that are employed over here may be the highest performance processors, according to what you read on the web. Uh, but basically, we have a bottleneck over here also in terms of memory. And I'm going to show you that more. 
And we've known this actually for a long time. Uh, these are actually some quotes over here. Uh, this is uh, Dick Seitz, who was the chief architect of the Alpha processor, which were the fastest processor of their time in 1990s. And after he designed the first Alpha chip, uh, or second, 21164 EV5, he basically wrote a one-page article in Microprocessor Report where he said, it's a one-pager, it's a beautiful article, I would recommend reading it, uh, and he said in that article, we've designed this chip on this important database workload, uh, uh, the chip is designed to finish four instructions per cycle, but on this important database workload, it's finishing one instruction every 4.2 to 4.5 cycles. Essentially, it's operating at 1 17th on 1 18th of its bandwidth. Why? Because it's waiting for memory. And he ends the article saying that all future microprocessor designs should focus on the memory system. Actually, I have that quote later on, I think, somewhere. I have, a, I have the same slide later when I motivate processing in memory. So we're going to go through that really fast when we get to it. I'm not going to go as far as what he said over there, but I think it's really important to focus on memory. Okay, that's 1990s. Uh, fast forward to 2003 or so. This is my own PhD thesis, where we analyzed uh, a bunch of memory-intensive workloads that Intel uses to design its processors with. And we found out that most of the time this processor is waiting for memory. <laughs> Essentially, we're designing these computers and they're always waiting for memory. And actually, I'm going to show you something from Google later on, but I wanted to leave it off later. So fast forward 10 years later, it's the same story. Processors are essentially bottlenecked by data uh, today. Okay, so that's the performance aspect. Even though the performance of the core has improved a lot, uh, if you cannot supply data quickly to the processor, it's going to stall for a long time. Okay, uh, there's the energy aspect also, which is also important. Uh, essentially, uh, this is again data from IBM uh, pa uh, in IBM's big iron systems in about 2000 or so. Uh, it's a beautiful paper that discusses where does energy go in these big servers. And they basically showed at that time that more than 42% of the entire system energy is spent uh, on the off-chip memory hierarchy. At that time, the off-chip memory hierarchy included the DRAM, the off-chip interconnect, the off-chip storage, and a bunch of other stuff, uh, and large caches also. Some of the off uh, a lot of the caches were off-chip at that time. Fast forward, uh, the same folks analyzed the, analyzed the power consumption on IBM Power 8 in 2010 in this uh, nice paper, and they show that more than 40% of the entire system power is just in DRAM. DRAM remained off-chip. A lot of the power efficiency improvements went into the core. As a result, DRAM became the big power bottleneck. That's true for GPUs also. There are a bunch of papers that talk about that as well. And uh, clearly, uh, uh, actually right now, I think this is consuming power uh, by refreshing its memory self in self-refresh mode. Most of the power is spent on self-refresh right now. And one of the issues we have with DRAM is it needs to refresh itself when it's not used because it's... Uh, um, that's, that's a fundamental reliable chip problem with the technology, right? Okay, uh, but we know also that energy cost of data movement is not good. Uh, this is data from uh, Bill Daly's presentation from 2015 in his high peak keynote. Essentially, it shows that the 64 bit double precision floating point operation costs about 20 picojoules, whereas a, a single DR meter or write costs about 16 nanojoules. Of course, you can argue with these numbers, it's very technology dependent. Uh, and I actually exaggerated over here saying that uh, a memory access consumes three orders of magnitude energy of a complex addition. But actually, you see these numbers uh, two to three orders of magnitude. It's not three orders of magnitude, maybe, but two, to two orders of magnitude is very real. Actually, I was at DAC in, uh, in, in Las Vegas last month. Uh, people were talking about AI accelerators, and one person was giving numbers in terms of how much more costly is data movement from DRAM into their AI accelerator, and they quoted the number 160x. So, okay, maybe it's not 1000x, it's not 800x, 160x is still pretty high. Okay, and we've actually recently done this study. I'm going to talk about this more. Uh, we've looked at uh, these consumer devices and uh, some key Google workloads uh, like TensorFlow, uh, VP9, uh, video encoding and decoding, and also browser. And we found out that more than 60% of the entire system energy is spent on data movement solely across the memory hierarchy. Okay, so that's the energy cost of memory. On top of this, DRAM technology scaling is ending. We're going to talk about that more. Uh, ITRS, International Technology Roadmap of Semiconductors, has been projecting for a long time that DRAM will not easily scale below X nanometers. Of course, whenever they have, uh, uh, they don't say X, whenever they release their report, they change their report every time, every year. And clearly, I don't want to keep co my slides coherent with their report, so X is good for me. But as clearly, as you reduce the feature size of a DRAM cell, as you reduce X, 
you get a lot of benefits. You get higher capacity, which is most very important. You get lower cost and lower energy. Of course, these are going away with the going away of Denard scaling today. Uh, but at least you get higher capacity still, right? And lower cost. But if this actually goes away, DRAM doesn't scale uh, anymore, then we have a problem. We're not able to satisfy these requirements well. And we're going to talk about that. We're already having issues with scaling. So let me give you briefly the problem. This is actually a problem with any memory technology. Any memory technology needs to scale if you want to increase the capacity. And the, any memory technology is a storage device and an access device. And for any memory technology to work well, that storage device needs to work well, and the access device needs to work well. In DRAM, the storage device happens to be the capacitor, so it's a charge-based memory, and the access device is the access transistor, bit line, and the sense amplifier, and all of the circuitry around it. And for this to work, the capacitor must be large enough for reliable sensing, and the access transistor and the peripheral circuitry must be large enough or reliable enough for low leakage and high retention time. And as uh, this was the value that was assigned to X by ITRS in 2009. Basically, reducing the size of the cell below 35 nanometers is challenging, they said in 2009. Does anybody know what's the future size of a DRAM cell today, cutting edge DRAM cell? 20, 50. 20, yeah, 20 or 50. Yeah, 22. 22? Actually, it's lower than that. Really? We're about 17 right now. We're not at 11 yet. But I think <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I use the I use the terminology used by the manufacturers and ITRS basically. Yeah, maybe it it corresponds to something else. You're right. <laughs> uh, but yes, it's 17 nanometers in the same consistent terminology that's used in the DR. Okay. So basically, we have a problem. Uh, capacity, cost, and energy and power are hard to scale. And I think this is not just in DRAM, it's also in flash. We don't have time to talk about flash, but these are charge-based memories. And you have a problem with charge placement and control in charge-based memories in general. And reliable sensing becomes difficult as charge storage unit size reduces over time. And we're having these problems with DRAM. Flash memory actually hit those limits earlier than DRAM, but flash manufacturers are actually innovative. And they were able to actually figure out how to stack flash cells in a three-dimensional manner. So now we have vertical flash, 3D NAND, and that enabled them to actually increase the size of the cell and not have these scaling problems, but they were still able to improve capacity by stacking many of these cells on top of each other, like 128 layers, for example. They started with much smaller, of course, but now they're getting close to 128. So they actually were able to increase the size and they, they fixed the scaling problem in it by going three-dimensional. I think DRAM is not easy to go three-dimensional that way. <laughs> it's not clear if it's going to happen. So we're going to actually have a scaling problem for, for some time now. But of course, another way of solving the problem is getting rid of the charge, right? The resistive memories actually don't rely on uh, the charge placement and control. Uh, as they rely on the resistance uh, differences uh, between the states uh, of some material, for example. And as a result, they're much more scalable fundamentally. But of course, they have some other problems which we're not going to talk about right now. So, okay, this is some real data from the field. This is a study that we did with Facebook. We analyzed all of Facebook's uh, memory errors worldwide in all of their data centers. Actually, basically, Facebook was very good at recording all of their memory errors in all of their uh, servers. And this is a lot of servers. So you can actually do a lot of statistically significant analyses on them. And we found this is one of the analyses that we've done. Essentially, this is the correlation that you see on a server that has a DRAM that has this particular chip density and the failure rate that you see on that server. Essentially, there is approximately linear correlation over here, as you can see. So basically, you have quadratic increase in capacity. As a result, uh, basically, cells are close to each other over here. Uh, as a result, uh, they're more prone to failure, whereas in these chips that are less dense, cells are not as close. As a result, they are less prone to failure. Of course, I didn't give you exactly what this means, but you have to read the paper because you need to, this, because it's a correlational study, you need to actually uh, do the study uh, right so that you can actually compare these different sample sets. As you, Okay, so and th that's the paper if you're really interested. So there's a lot of evidence from the field that DRAM uh, is becoming less reliable as chips become denser and denser. Yes? What do you mean by failure? So basically, these are the errors that are recorded uh, in the system. So all errors that are recorded. Exactly, all errors that are recorded. This may or may not lead to system failure in the end. These may be handled by the system. And the paper has a lot of analysis on that also. Let's say it again. Is it despite ECC or without? Uh, this is with ECC. That's how we catch the errors, actually. And there are some uncorrectable errors that we may, uh, there, are some, uh, there are some failures we may not be able to catch, actually, if, they're actu uh, if there are multi-bit errors that are not corrected and that are not detected. Okay, 
and we, we're not able to quantify them as a result. We can quantify the uncorrectable ones that are detected, and there is a rate over there also. Okay, so uh, uh, we've been doing actually very uh, small scale studies also using these FPGA based devices that can test memory uh, and we have actually newer incarnations of this. We've been building a lot of infrastructure. In the next part of the uh, tutorial I'm going to delve deeper into this. Uh, and we've actually released this infrastructure, infrastructure. If anyone's interested in doing these studies you can actually download our code. It has a nice C++ API. We're working on a second uh, version uh, that's we may support also if you're interested, uh, but other people are using and discovering interesting things uh, in, in chips right now, uh, and I'd be happy to talk about this. So one of the things that we've uh, found with this infrastructure is you can predictably induce errors in most DRAM memory chips. This is the row hammer phenomenon in DRAM, which I'm going to spend a significant time uh, in the uh, next part of the talk. Essentially, it's a simple hardware failure mechanism that can create a widespread system security vulnerability. By hammering a row, keeping on activating it, you can induce bit flips predictably in adjacent rows. And this is the, a reliability problem, clearly, but it's a security problem because now an attacker can do this uh, by slipping code that, uh, that, can that can do this at user level in your system. And as a result, people are writing interesting uh, articles like this. Forget software, hackers are exploiting physics to do this row hammer attacks. I'm not going to go into this detail right now. Uh, I'm going to talk about that in the second part of the tutorial. But we recently written a retrospective paper that covers a lot of the work uh, that has gone on row hammer in the last five years. If you're really interested, in, you might want to take a look at this retrospective paper. Unfortunately, it doesn't include the latest attacks because people, are, people are keep still, uh, still keep developing new attacks. Uh, okay, essentially, uh, DRAM scaling has already become increasingly difficult. There are a bunch of issues that are well documented. As a result, it's difficult to significantly improve capacity and energy. And emerging memory technologies are promising. Some of the emerging memory technologies are DRAM based, some of them are not DRAM based. 3D stack DRAM is, I think, very interesting. It solves some of the problems. The reduced latency DRAM, I think, for which we need to do more research. It's very interesting, of course. Low power DRAM, I think all of the DRAM going forward needs to be somewhat low power. Uh, and non-volatile memory, which I club into many things over here. Clearly, non-volatile memory also has very different types as well. And maybe I'm not fair by saying just larger capacity over here, but bear with me. Uh, clearly, these different types of technologies have greens, but they all have reds also. So there's no single memory type that seems to be green at every metric that we want. Uh, even though once in a while people claim that, oh, I have this memory that's good at everything you want. And soon you figure out that that's not true. I think this is a fundamentally difficult problem. It's like the sequencing machines. You cannot get a sequencing machine that can sequence the entire uh, genome uh, with high accuracy, at least. So as a result, because of this, you have different types of memories with different grees and different reds. What, uh, people are putting together different types of memories. Maybe they're not necessarily uh, different technologies, but clearly that's also going to happen. Uh, they may be different types of DRAM, for example, uh, with different characteristics different greens and different reds. And uh, we designed the hardware and the software to manage data allocation and movement to achieve the greens as much as possible while avoiding the reds as much as possible. So this is the notion of hybrid memory systems. There's a lot of work in this area, clearly, and there's going to be a lot more work. Uh, but I'm going to make the point for the first time over here that if you really want to take advantage of a system that looks like this, you really want to design your controllers to be intelligent. So I think your, your controllers need to be aware of what's going on in the different types of memories, uh, what's going on in your data patterns, access patterns, and they need to allocate the data intelligently, or at least help the software allocate the data intelligently uh, across these memories. I'm going to start making this point uh, a lot during the rest of the tutorial, because I think this is going to be important going forward. Uh, and I think the scaling problems are not new to industry also. Uh, while we were actually demonstrating the Rohammer phenomenon in ISCA 2014, uh, these two companies that normally don't talk to each other have written a paper together in the memory forum uh, that we organized, Samsung and Intel. I don't think I've ever seen any other paper from Samsung and Intel, in a collaborative manner at least. Maybe someone moved from Samsung and Intel and had an affiliation, but that's not the case here. Basically, the memory controller team um, and memory team in, at, at, at Intel and the DRAM design team, circuit design team at Samsung got together. They said, DRAM is becoming very difficult to scale, so maybe we should have intelligent controllers 
that can overcome some of these issues that we're having at the technology scaling device levels. And they've actually called out three major problems. Refresh, basically retention times are becoming increase, uh, reducing. As a result, refresh rates are increasing. And we've actually been seeing this. For example, uh, we used to refresh LPDDR memories every 64 milliseconds. Now the refresh rate is 32 milliseconds. That's the default. And there are actually, as you increase the temperature, you need to reduce it to 16 milliseconds. And I think this is going to uh, reduce going forward even more. Uh, also, retention times are becoming very difficult to determine because of quantum-like effects that you have in these very scaled devices. Uh, you may test the memory at this point, and it may have a very long retention time, hundreds of seconds. You may test the same cell 100 seconds later. It may have a very short retention time, uh, like 8 milliseconds. Now the question is, how do you determine the minimum retention time of the cell uh, without excessive testing? Um, and it turns out it's not very easy to do. As a result, main memory manufacturers have already added error correcting codes inside their DRAM chips uh, to overcome such scaling issues. Of course, this is, this is a very, very interesting issue that I may go into detail later on. This, this happens because chart gets randomly uh, trapped uh, in the uh, access transistor and as a result uh, when charge gets trapped uh, in the access transistor uh, the charge in the capacitor leaks extremely fast this is called trap assist trap induced data assisted drain leakage TIGIDL or TAGIDL uh, and this is a very well known phenomenon in DRAM for 30 years uh, more than 30 years actually right now uh, but it's increasing significantly as the circuit technology scales to smaller technology nodes and it's becoming it's become difficult to prevent without ECC as a result now we have ECC and in this paper actually uh, Samsung and Intel mentioned that we need ECC in DRAM chips because of issues like this they also talk about write latencies are increasing which is also important, I think, but not as fundamental, in my opinion, compared to these other two. And as a result, they say that we could solve these issues much better if we actually have more intelligent memory controllers that are, that are potentially aware of refresh uh, retention time differences, for example, between the cells. I'm not going to talk about this in detail right now, but this is to motivate that we're having serious reliability problems. Okay, uh, let me talk about an orthogonal issue over here. Uh, basically, uh, I, I'm switching gears. Uh, we've talked about DRAM quite a bit. You may design your main memory with any technology, scalable. Uh, if it's a shared medium across different cores, cores interfere with each other when accessing shared memory, and you need to do something about this, essentially. If you don't control the interference that's happening, uh, you may cause denial of service. For example, one core may have very nice uh, access patterns that the memory controller prioritizes over others. As a result, this core uh, gets its request serviced, and none of the other cores get their request serviced for some time. So this interference problem needs to be solved. Uh, and this problem is also getting worse going into the future. Essentially, we have uh, the DRAM and hybrid memory controllers over here. We have a bunch of heterogeneous agents with very different types of demands from main memory. Uh, hardware accelerators may have different latency and bandwidth requirements. Different general purpose applications running on CPUs may have very different latency and bandwidth and performance requirements. GPUs clearly have different requirements at different times. And they, have, they share different parts of the hierarchy also. And memory is also becoming complex. And we have a lot of interference in the system. And I, I think of this as memory controller being the center of the world over here. Everything goes through the memory controller in a device like this, actually. And you need to design the memory controller intelligently so that it can satisfy all of the requirements over here while being aware of what's going on in the memories that it's controlling. So it's not an easy problem, uh, but I think if you want to be able to do that, you need intelligent controllers. I think this requires a lot more intelligence in the memory controller, and they're becoming more intelligent, but there needs to be more work in this area for sure. Okay, I think this is going to be the last part of the first part of the uh, 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 tutorial. So basically the question is how do you solve the memory problem? I think uh, there are multiple directions clearly. Uh, I believe we are going to talk a lot about this one making memory and controllers more intelligent in general. Uh, I believe this requires new interfaces, new functions, and new architectures. I call the system memory co-design. Uh, the Intel uh, Samsung paper calls it the co-architecting memory controllers and DRAM together, for example. If we could eliminate the problems, that's good. Uh, maybe we can eliminate some of the problems by replacing DRAM with a different technology. It's not clear if this is going to happen. Uh, but the good thing is we have some of these technologies in the market right now. Intel has the 3D point uh, that you can, well, I guess they call it persistent memory. I don't know what they call it exactly, but the memory version of their Optane. And you can buy it, and you can put it on your computer and do interesting things with it, but it's not there yet, clearly. And it's not clear that it will ever get to the point uh, that we have at DRAM. 
but I think this enables some new technology that maybe system-wide rethinking of memory and storage uh, in a different way. Hybrid memory systems is a part of it, for example. And maybe embracing some of the problems is a good idea also. Uh, maybe we can design some heterogeneous memories that are none of which are perfect, and we can map data intelligently across them. And some of them may be not so reliable, some of them may be extremely reliable. If we understand the properties of our data, maybe we can take advantage of the unreliable memories also. And I think I call this embracing the problem. This may lead to new models of data management and maybe even usage. And, but I believe solutions to memory scaling require software, hardware, and device cooperation because all of these directions, in my opinion, are cooperative across the stack. They're not actually proposing solutions at one level of the stack, really. So we need to really think across the stack going forward. So let me quickly go over these, uh, and then I'll uh, switch to the next part of the uh, tutorial. Basically, how do we uh, design new memory architectures? I think this requires more memory-centric memory thinking and memory-centric system design. We want me new memory architectures, new interface, and new functions from memory. And also better waste management in memory also. We're wasting a lot of the memory capacity that we have today. A lot of people have shown that uh, memory is storing zeros, for example. 30, 40, 50 percent of your memory is storing zeros. Is that a good usage of a very valuable resource? Uh, you're actually transferring a lot of data across a very bandwidth-limited memory bus today. And you may not be using all of that data. Is that a good usage? There are many key issues to tackle. We're going to talk about some of these. Enabling reliability at low cost is important because it's really key to high capacity. Ena reducing energy is important. Reducing latency, improving bandwidth, reducing waste. And we're going to talk about the latency waste, for example. Yes, please. I have to disturb you. Sure. You forgot about average Joe programmer. Yeah, yeah, we're going to talk about that. <laughs> Not for me, it's a key issue. Yeah, yeah so it's, it's certainly a key issue uh, for enabling computation close to data, for example. Uh, that, uh, that requires uh, helping the average Joe program. But some of these issues can be, uh, for example, reducing latency can be done without disturbing the average Joe programmer, right? Especially if you get rid of the waste. So not everything that I'm pro uh, uh, proposing affects the average Joe programmer. If you have a very nice memory controller mechanism that gets rid of refresh, average Joe programmer doesn't need to deal with that. He doesn't even know if cache exists. <laughs> uh, that's true, yeah, average. <laughs> that's, that's also true. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, that's a very good point. We want to enable computation close to data, hopefully without killing the average, average Joe programmer. <laughs> Okay, so there are a bunch of things. These are some of the works that we've done in the area. There's more to be done, I think. So this is something that I'm not going to talk about, as I mentioned earlier, uh, enabling some of these emerging memory technologies. There are some emerging memory technologies that are resistive. Uh, they are more scalable than DRAM, and they're, on top of this, they are non-volatile. I wanted to talk about this early on to get it out of the way, but we don't have enough time to talk about it clearly. Uh, phase change memory is one example. This is actually a slide from, that I used for, since 2009. Uh, the first paper that we published in the area is 2009. Intel now has, I believe, phase change memory based mem uh, 3DX point. They don't. I don't. They, I don't think they call it phase change memory. But I think now it's evident. Uh, it's evident. I agree with. I agree with the fact that it's evident. But I they still don't admit that it's phase change memory. But 10 years later, now it's real. I think that's the good part. Now I can say that this is not an emerging technology. This exists. <laughs> So I'm really happy about that. Uh, but basically, uh, phase change memory is one example technology that's uh, resistive and much more scalable than DRAM. Uh, and it basically uses the phase of material as a way of encoding data. And uh, data is read by detecting the material's resistance. Uh, and this was actually old technology. This is technology that was developed in 1960s. It's used in rewritable CDs. Except in rewritable CDs, you take advantage of the fact that these two states these two phases have different optical reflexivities. So the reading process is very slow in that case. You don't want that to be your part of your main memory. If you want main memory, you, have a, you want to have a read device that's really fast. And why this has become really interesting at this point is a lot of people have invested in the technology to build these read devices that are really fast. IBM is one example, Intel is another example. And they were able to get those read devices to be really fast. And as a result, they, were, they have a memory technology that's almost competitive with DRAM. Not exactly, because the read latencies are still about 4x, maybe 5x, maybe even longer in the existing uh, devices that are out there. Uh, but it's, it may get there. And also, it's expected to be denser than DRAM. And if you're really interested in uh, the, the technology itself, IBM Journal of Research and Development has this beautiful paper that talks about the technology level issues in phase change memory. And the problem is these technologies have a lot of shortcomings as well, like latency, energy, endurance. The key question is, can we somehow enable them to replace, augment, 
or maybe even surpass DRAM because they're non-volatile, you can exploit the persistence. Uh, you can directly write to persistent data structures inside these memories, which you cannot do in DRAM because DRAM is fundamentally volatile. You have to have a backing store that's persistent. So in this case, you can actually build systems that can surpass DRAM as well. But uh, not always. If you don't care about persistence, uh, the, the properties of the memory is not as good in terms of latency and energy. Uh, well, at least the dynamic energy, active energy, compared to DRAM. Okay, so there's, there's a lot to talk about clearly uh, in this direction, but we're not going to focus on that uh, in this tutorial. And there are a bunch of papers uh, that I'd be happy to talk about. So as a result of this uh, dichotomy between these technologies, I think building hybrid memory systems is very important, and uh, I think there's going to be more and more of these that we will see going into the future. And they're not only uh, always different types of technology, it could be different types of DRAM as well uh, that are in the hybrid memories. I'm going to give you one example over here. This is based on some study that we did together with Microsoft in 2013. Essentially, applications have different characteristics in terms of their uh, tolerance uh, to uh, bit errors. So whenever you get a bit flip in memory, uh, some data doesn't care about it, right? If it's a pixel in your... Uh, uh, video, for example, maybe you don't care about it. Uh, there are a bunch of other examples clearly over here. But some data uh, leads to a system crash, right? It may be a, a data structure that's really important for uh, your uh, operating system. If you can somehow identify your data as vulnerable and tolerant, which we did in one study in a coarse grain uh, in Microsoft's web search workload, you can also design your memories to adapt to the different characteristics of the data. Maybe this can be very low cost with very, very little error correction, coarse grain, slow. This can be very, very reliable and very high cost. And we actually looked at some design space over here. Of course, the design space is huge. We didn't explore it fully. But this one example, and uh, we call this the heterogeneous reliability memory. So this one example of a heterogeneous memory that's based on the same technology, DRAM, but you do different things with the DRAM uh, in terms of reliability characteristics. Maybe you don't even test these as much. And we showed that actually if you have this sort of structure, you can reduce the server hardware cost significantly while achieving pretty reasonable availability targets in these workloads. Uh, and our goal in this case was actually uh, not even scale memory, but it was more eliminate the ECC overhead that we have in the data centers uh, at that time. I'm not sure if that's the best use of these heterogeneous reliability memory technologies, but I think there is a huge open area to explore in terms of how we design these heterogeneous reliability memories, how do we map the data, how do we de design the system software stack for this, and how do we not kill the average programmer Joe while doing this, right? <laughs> because that could be a problem in this case, right? Who, somebody needs to decide what is vulnerable and what is not vulnerable. And if you make a mistake, that could be a deadly mistake, right? Whenever intelligence is required, it's a no-go. Okay, I see. <laughs> you know, not, not every... Okay, I, I will also say that not all of these optimizations are targeted towards average programmer Joe. True. <laughs> there are some very smart programmers, I don't know, whatever you want to call them, call them uh, Sue or whatever, <laughs> and they're, they're, they, they could actually be uh, the, the real targets of these optimizations. Okay, and if you're interested in this, this is the paper. And there are a bunch of works that I've built on it, uh, and I think this is very important. Okay, an orthogonal issue, I've already said this. I'm going to go through this relatively quickly also. I think this is really, really important, but I'm not going to talk about this also. Uh, basically, memory interference between cores is uncontrolled. If you don't control it, you basically are prone to unfairness, starvation, and low performance. Uh, and you have an uncontrollable, unpredictable, and vulnerable system. Actually, when I first joined Microsoft Research, I was really fascinated with this problem. And the first paper we wrote on this topic was that you using security, and we called it memory performance attacks. Essentially, uh, you could uh, cause denial of service attacks by exploiting the unfairness in the memory controller because it doesn't, it prioritizes applications that are streaming over applications that are random access, for example, or not intensive memory applications. And uh, the solution is really designing the memory system to be more quality of service aware, to be aware of the different demands of the applications, and to be, have a fairness substrate, essentially. So you need to bake in a configurable fairness substrate uh, into the hardware with different mechanisms. It could be application aware memory scheduling, request scheduling, partitioning, and throttling. And you need to be able to enable the configuration of the substrate by the system software, for example, to enable different kinds of quality of service goals. And I think this can lead to pre uh, predictable performance and higher efficiency. Uh, I'm not going to go through the detail. I'm going to talk about a couple of works very quickly over here. But we want really strong memory service guarantees for some applications. 
because there are some applications that require really strong latency or bandwidth guarantees or performance or slowdown guarantees. And we've been looking at some techniques more recently uh, to estimate the performance loss of an application online while it's running together with apl other applications. And this is not an easy problem actually because there's a lot of interference that happens in many different parts of the memory system. Caches, memory controls, interconnect. How do you account for that interference and estimate the, how much performance you're losing compared to when you're running alone, for example. And once you know that information with some accuracy, what do you do with that information? If, you, if, if your memory controller or some part of your memory system provides that information, what do you do with it? Basically, you need to partition your resource or prioritize such that you can satisfy the required performance level for all, all applications. Of course, you want to do this all the while providing high system throughput. Because if you, all you care about is the performance of one application at the expense of everything else, then you just run that application, right? So it's an easy problem, actually, if this is not a constraint. Okay, again, I think I'm not going to talk about this more, but these are some of the works uh, that I just referenced here, uh, and I'd be happy to talk about it. Okay, this is the agenda for today. Uh, we've covered memory imports and trends. Uh, I guess we're not too shabby. It's about only 70 minutes. Uh, and uh, I intend to talk about Rowhammer, memory reliability and security, and then in-memory computation and low-latency memory, and then uh, wrap up with some guiding principles and conclusion. Does it sound like a reasonable plan? Okay, so let's move to part two then.